Thank you very much, John, and uh, members of the faculty and students of Augsburg College. This is a very broad subject uh, to cover, and I'm partly responsible for broadening it. Since originally I think the title was uh, Ethical Issues and Party Politics. I thought it would be wise to broaden it, uh, primarily because the area of politics, it seems to me, is so often confined to party politics, whereas politics is much more a segment of life than would be implied in the term party politics. Politics arises, I suppose one can say, when men no longer follow tradition blindly and custom. They have to build their ardor of collective affairs consciously and deliberately. And when this conscious and deliberate ardor arises, then we are confronted with choices, you see, in public matters just as we are in private matters. And it's out of this situation that ethical issues in politics arise. Uh, now, we can't avoid these ethical issues. There's no way under the sun that we can avoid them. Even if we say we're going to abstain from the political world, as many have in the past, you see, this too is a judgment, you see, involving ethical implications. Whether we like it or not, we are all, therefore, involved in politics, particularly in a world where ancient tradition and custom are being undermined more and more every day with rapidity of social change and with the rise of cities. As cities grow, as the countryside and the rural outlook declines, politics becomes more and more important, you see, willy-nilly no matter what we think, whether we like it or not. And therefore, as responsible human beings, which I assume all of us would like to be, morally responsible to our fellow human beings, religiously responsible to God, we cannot avoid the ethical problems or implications involved in the political sphere. Now, this is not to say that all questions of politics are matters of moral right and wrong. We won't be arguing that. Presumably some political issues are uh, matters of indifference morally. That is to say, for example, uh, if the problem is should we drive on the right side of the road or the left side of the road, and this is being debated in the city council, this does not involve any great issues of moral right and wrong. Probably it doesn't. At least I can't see how it does. Do you? Uh, whether, uh, but, but it is very important that we all drive on the same side of the road, you see. So that issues of this sort would not involve matters of moral right and wrong. I hope that's clear. So I'm not arguing here this morning that every question in politics is a matter of right and wrong, although all issues in politics, you see, involve choices, uh, which in turn may involve issues of wisdom as well as matters of right and wrong. But a very high percentage of all questions in politics and of our attitudes to the political order will involve, in one way or another, moral questions. Uh, one reason we think they don't is because we don't think about them, you see. And that's why I'm so happy to see that Augsburg devotes a whole week to political emphasis, to raising issues of how we can deliberately and consciously create an order, a social order, you see, to take the place of the order of tradition in a world where humanity becomes more and more crowded together in cities and where the implications of moral issues often are not discerned. This is the kind of question that we want to discuss for a few moments this morning.
Now, I'd like to divide what I have to say into two major parts. First of all, to look at some of the overall questions that arise when we act as political beings and the difficulties and the, the dilemmas morally which we confront as members of the community. You see, whatever the community may be, you're making political decisions when you participate in trying to create an order in the Lutheran Church, you see. This is a political decision, too, and it involves politics. You're making political decisions when you participate in your trade union, you see, trying to consciously to create some ordering of affairs. You're making political decisions in your chamber of commerce, as well as in what we call the state and international affairs. So that politics is a very broad notion. You see, if you follow this kind of a definition. Now, what are some of the general issues that are involved in ethics and politics? And then I'd like to turn, secondly, to three illustrations of what seem to me to be pointed questions involving morals in the 20th century. Uh, that also involve, of course, the political order. Broadly speaking, the issues turn on how we discover the right and then do it. You see, those are the two great moral questions. How do we discover what is right? And then how do we make sure that we do it? In a context of complex organization, you see, this is one of the central questions, overall questions. Not only how I determine the right for myself, but also the conception of right which I shall support for the organization of which I am a part. So there are two questions, you see, involving moral issues. What my personal attitude will be, how I will act in relation to the organization of which I am a part, and secondly, what kinds of issues and what kinds of proposals will I think important for changing that organization? These are the two questions that will run through our discussion. See, what my personal attitude will be, how I will react, how I will make my choices within the context of the organization, and secondly, how I will endeavor to judge the issues involving change in the organization, because change is inevitable in one way or another. In what direction ought the change to go, given our moral values? You see. Now, another kind of uh, a great issue is uh, involving this whole sphere is all agree that men should be brothers, I suppose. We're all agreed with this proposition. But how do we determine what brotherhood implies when often within the assumptions of an organization, ecclesiastical, uh, state, labor, or other kind of an organization, within the assumptions are of an organization to be a brother to another human being is in conflict with the organization, you see. Now, this happens quite frequently, as I'd like to point out. Another a kind of general issue that we'll see in every sphere will be what Reinhold Niebuhr calls the tragic nature of many of our decisions. That is to say, it won't be clear as to what is right and what is wrong when we're involved in a political situation. Uh, we like to think that the issues of right and wrong are simple. In reality, they often aren't. And so when I make my decision, whether in terms of how I'm going to act in relation to my organization or how I'm going to propose changes for that organization, uh, this decision will often have to be a kind of leap of faith since we can never be completely certain, probably, 
about the rightness or wrongness of our decision in a complex organization. In fact, I would argue that it's very difficult in personal relations always to be certain about what is right and what is wrong. Now, some of you may differ with me at this point, but that is man's dilemma, you see, that he's often confronted with decisions which are cloudy, both sides, uh, all, 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 all five alternatives, let's say, or ten alternatives, are cloudy ethically. Uh, not all of them are this way, but often decisions are of this nature, and it's very difficult for up, us to make up our mind as to what to do. Now, it's at this point, of course, when the alternatives all seem to be cloudy, that many of us tend to retreat, you see. We say, well, we can't make a decision, so we sit on the fence. And we say, well, we're being more moral, perhaps, than those who try to make a decision because we'll, really we can't make a decision. Some, some will put it this way, all the evidence is not in, you see. Of course, all the evidence never will be in. And yet human beings must act, you see, must make decisions, both as individuals and in groups. And so if I seem to be dogmatic at certain points in what follows, in using my illustrations. Remember that I'm very uncertain at many points as to the kinds of judgments I'm making. But nevertheless, in order to get the discussion going, at least inwardly within you, I would like to take a position on a number of the issues that we'll be looking at. Now, a last overriding difficulty, it seems to me, general difficulty, in looking at the sphere of morals and politics is the very great difficulty of predicting what the consequences of a decision or an act will be. And yet, if we're going to be responsible as moral beings, we have to take into account the consequences of a decision. You cannot separate the means from the end are the end from the means. As one 19th century thinker put it, show me not the end without the means, for means and ends on earth are so entangled that choosing one, we choose the other two. Each different means brings different ends in view. And so while we're often accustomed to separating means from ends, we can't really do it. They're organically interrelated. The old statement, you cannot produce good out of evil, see, is involved here. And yet how can man really predict or forecast what the consequences of decisions are going to be. Here again, it's a great temptation to retreat and say this whole problem is of no consequences. Let's go on to heaven, you see. But the point I would make is you cannot go to heaven without facing precisely these moral issues in the political realm. There is no other road to heaven except by becoming morally responsible human beings and facing these dilemmas, even if we at many points are not certain about the rightness of our decisions. Now, I'd like to take three spheres to illustrate some of the problems I've suggested here this morning. First of all, the involvement of the individual in political action in general. Secondly, the problem of the relation of the individual to the economic order. As you see, the economic order is a matter of politics. Don't anyone kid you into believing it isn't. And thirdly, the problem of war as simply illustrations of some of these dilemmas. In each case, in each of these three cases, I should like, first of all, to refer to the problem of what my attitude will be, given the framework of the organization. 
within which I operate, what some of the problems at that level are. And secondly, the, the, the great problem of my responsibility for changing the order of which I am a part, you see, in a world which demands constant rethinking of political issues. Now, those two levels are very closely interrelated, but I think uh, they can be separated and ought to be separated for discussion. Let's take the first point then. Political action in general, what kinds of uh, dilemmas does it create for the individual who would be morally responsible? Well, let me put it in this way. If you accept the premise that we should all be active in politics, broadly defined, as I suggested here, that we have to be as morally accountable human beings, the question immediately arises as to, as to whether if you are active in politics, as this moral imperative seems to suggest that we be, that you don't get caught up in the means and forget the ultimate end, you see. That is to say, it's notorious that when you get intent on winning an election victory, let's say, that the longer you remain in a political organization, the greater the difficulty for you to keep in mind the purpose of political organization, the greater the temptation for you to make the organization an end rather than a means, you see. And we have such well-known observations that all organizations tend to take on an autonomy of their own. And individuals forget that they exist for a larger purpose, you see. That is, the politician in a political party, the longer he is active, the greater is the tendency for him to think of victory in an election as an end in itself. The greater the temptation to compromise in such a situation. Let me illustrate in terms of my own dilemma at this point. I can support neither of the major parties in the United States today. In fact, I feel very, very uneasy in my own Socialist Party, largely because it seems to me that neither of the major, that both of the major parties are committed to positions on what I would regard as the overwhelmingly important issue of war and peace to positions very much alike. I can't distinguish between the two of them. So that any minor distinctions that they may have uh, on matters of how much you're going to give for Social Security, let's say, uh, 29 45 a month or 35 21 a month, fade into insignificance, you see against the proposition that both major parties are committed to using warfare and killing human beings for ends which they deem to be just. You see. Well, I can't really make a decision between Democratic and Republican at that point. And I'm very unhappy that I can't because uh, social, uh, so the Socialist Party being virtually wiped out uh, I'm a factionalist, you see, a sectarian. This means that I have to make a decision of some sort. My decision, rightly or wrongly, has been what I call one of conscientious abstention. That is, I try to weigh the issues, and if I come up, as I have uh, in the last few presidential elections at least, with the conclusion that there is no substantial difference between the, the stands of the two candidates in terms, to, in terms of this overriding issue of foreign policy, then I feel that I am making as much of a contribution to the community by conscientiously abstaining for vo from voting for either candidate, you see, giving my reasons, as I would be by supporting the so-called lesser of the two evils. From my point of view, there is no lesser of the two evils, you see, if you evaluate the total political world in this way. Now, 
Having said that, you see, I'm uneasy about my decision. I'm sorry to refer to personal attitudes here, but I, I thought they'd be, they'd illustrate the problems that we're talking about more fully. Uh, now, you may come out at a different point, you see. You may think that other issues are more important than the international issue. Or you may think that there is a substantial difference between the two. If so, of course, you're going to come out with a different view than mine. But the point I'm trying to make is that both of us end up, in a sense, if we're honest, with a sense of uncertainty about the kind of decision we make, and yet we must make the decision. Uh, now, we're confronted by this at all levels, you see, in the church, this problem, in trade union organizations, in chambers of commerce, wherever men are consciously trying to develop policy you see, and consciously trying to order their relations with one another. This is the area of politics. Now, on the second point in connection, the second sub-point in connection with point one, uh, you know, we're dealing with the problem of what should be our attitude to change in politics in general and to the standards that now prevail in the general realm of organization. Here again, I think you have a, a great number of ethical dilemmas. Uh, uh, dilemmas that, if we become conscious of the political arena, take on a new light. For example, we generally think, don't we, that it's wrong to bribe a voter. Uh, or do you? Maybe you don't. <laughs> By handing him over money, you see, to purchase his vote. Yet we do not think it wrong I think probably because we've never thought about it. For a politician to promise a billion dollars to a special interest group if he's elected, we don't call that bribery. Now, what's the difference between handing over a dollar to a voter to get his vote and promising a huge handout to a special interest group, let's say, uh, in return for collective support, you see. In other words, the individual doesn't get it, but a group gets it. Now, what is the distinction ethically between those two acts? Now, there may be a distinction. There may be a distinction. But if so, I find it very difficult to discover. Now, how can we reorder the general realm of politics in this context, for example, with uh, by taking account of this general moral problem that I've uh, turned to here, I referred to here. In general, of course, the more complex the organization, the greater the tendency to bureaucracy and to the organization becoming an end in itself. Now, how can we in the modern world, with its complex technology, make sure that organization subserves larger ends and doesn't become an end in itself in view of this tendency for all complex organization to get out of hand and uh, to become uncontrollable. This is an underlying issue, a moral issue in the contemporary world, the answer to which we uh, perhaps have various hypotheses, but we don't know precisely how the question can be answered. And many of you will be wrestling with this problem as you get involved in politics. You find yourself more and more saying, well, uh, in order to stay in office, uh, I don't agree with this, but let's give in at this point, you see. So you get elected. And once you're elected, well, I don't quite agree with this. Let's compromise here, though, you see. Before you know it, there are no, no issues on which you draw the line clearly. You see. You've forgotten that there has to be some sort of a line drawn or some sort of a limitation on what you do if you are to be constantly aware of the moral issues in political organization. Well, now I'd like to turn then to the second illustration. 
Again, at these two levels, my personal attitude are the problem of developing a personal attitude, and secondly, the problem of change in the organization itself. The economic order is basically grounded in politics. That is, it involves issues of public policy, you see. Now, given the assumptions of the existing economic order in the United States, many of its demands on me fly in the face of the demands of brotherhood. There is a conflict between my moral obligation to be brotherly and the necessity to survive economically. The businessman, for example, tempted to cut corners or to provide shoddy merchandise against his moral belief that he ought to provide good merchandise. Yet if he doesn't provide shoddy merchandise, he can't compete, you see, with his neighbor businessman and goes out of business. This has become a very common factor in the present economic order, partly, it would seem to me, being conditioned by the framework of that order. This is the way he has to act, you see, given the present framework of the American economic order, if he is to survive. So you preach to him on Sunday, now be a moral man, be a brother. And then on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, maybe Saturday, He's confronted with choices fixed for him by the economic order, which are really choices between being shady and a little less shady, you see. Look at the business world and see if this isn't true, and, and the professional world also. The conflict, for example, in medicine between uh, the doctor must confront this kind of a conflict when, as a member of a medical organization, he wants to control the number of doctors practicing medicine. This is the economic side. Committed to the, the need ethic, that is the need for more doctors, particularly in rural areas, he would commit himself to a, a greater supply of doctors, let's say. The trade unionist is confronted by the same issue, you see. He restricts the number of bricks he lays. Why? Because in the context or the framework of the existing economic order, quite often, he can't survive economically unless he restricts production. Supplies, you see, to the professions, too. And yet, if he were not living within the context of, of the present economic order, uh, he might say, of course, I want to lay as many bricks as I can. This is my obligation, my moral obligation as a dedicated bricklayer. Well, this kind of a choice confronts us when the economic order puts a premium on competition, on shoddy merchandise, on often machine-made products which don't work, you see. And it's difficult for the individual as such to live completely a moral life given the assumptions of such an order. Now, you haven't confronted this, most of you yet, probably. Maybe you have. Maybe you've confronted it at Augsburg. But you will confront it if you are morally sensitive human beings. Well, that leads us to the second level of this discussion of the economic order, then. That is to say, um, what do you do to change the economic order? To provide a framework within which individual choices can become genuinely moral in which I won't be confronted, perhaps, with impossible choices, in either case of which I cease to be a brother to my fellow human being. That's the problem. Now, there's no easy answer to it, of course. But let me consider, let's consider a few of the incongruities in the present economic order. We throw a girl in jail for prostituting her body. There's a big issue now in Minneapolis about this, you know. We get all excited about prostituting a body. How many human beings in the existing order have to prostitute their brains in advertising, for example? What's the difference ethically between making the kind of shady claims in advertising that often, I don't say all advertising does this, but a considerable part, 
the, the, the kind of shady claims in advertising that we're forced to do, given the premises of the existing economic order, and prostituting your body for gain, you see. Now, in my judgment, my ethical judgment, it's a far smaller offense for the poor girl to prostitute her body than for the man of intelligence and integrity to prostitute his brains for something in which he doesn't believe, but for which he gets a big income. You see. And yet in the existing order of things, I'm not condemning that man any more than I'm condemning the prostitute. The problem is to create an order of things in which the temptation to do these things will be eliminated, you see. Now, what kind of an order do you, uh, do you believe will do this? I personally think it's a socialist order. But you may differ with me. But the issue remains, you see. You can't avoid the issue. Let me give another example. Our present economic order permits speculation in land and natural resources. Thus, private individuals, by gambling on land, can get huge fortunes. It's gambling, that's what it is, you see. Because the increased value has been created by community growth, not by the individual. You can buy a land, a land let's say, $20 an acre 30 years ago and sell it now for $10,000 an acre. And not do anything to the land, not contribute one iota, you see, and still pocket the extra 9,000, what is it, well, whatever it is, dollars, even with inflation. You see. Our greatest fortunes have been built up this way. The Kennedy family, for example, built its fortune largely on whiskey speculation and land speculation. And then from this as a base, you see, they were able to go into politics with an enormous advantage. Now, how does this kind of an economic order that permits these things, you see, square with our professions of democratic equality and a social order based upon freedom of opportunity? Or you can illustrate it again in terms of income distribution in this country. Basic income distribution has not changed since 1910 in this country, at least. The upper 10% get about 28% of the income. The lower 10% get about 1% of the income. Even though real wages, that is, the, the, the increase in productivity has gone up, the distribution of power has remained about the same. Well, now, if you hold to democratic beliefs, how do you square this kind of a distribution with your moral principles. Now, the last illustration, and remember these are simply illustrations, I've raised only about one one-hundredth of all the issues that can be raised in connection with each point, is, of course, war. We proclaim in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill. And yet we're always justifying reasons for killing deliberate killing. The ancient Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu used to say, when he lived in the 6th century BC, we reward a man for killing many people in war, but we punish him for killing one person in peace. And this is literally true, and the issue is still with us. What should be the individual's attitude when he's summoned to kill Vietnamese in the jungles? Can he square it with his conscience, you see, no matter what the rationalization? This is the issue, I think, that confronts every young person today. And he must give some kind of an answer. To go, for example, into the army without thinking about this issue, is to abdicate moral responsibility, quite clearly. Now, you may come out saying, I should go into the army. It's my duty to. But if you go in unthinkingly, or if your girlfriend supports you in going in unthinkingly, both of you are morally irresponsible, you see. 
whatever your conclusion may be. Now, we do not know how to eliminate war yet. That's one of the greatest uh, issues before us, of course, how to change the order in which war seems to be endemic. We've had war ever since 1945, despite the Second World War, which was supposedly intended to eliminate it. It seems to me, however, that one of the great problems in changing the system which promotes war is to develop a consciousness in every individual that no war probably can be justified morally. Once we reach this firm conclusion and make no exceptions, we can get on with the detailed problem of reorganizing the, wor the world to eliminate it institutionally. But as long as we say, well, you know, like the vegetarian who is a vegetarian between meals only, as long as we say there are always exceptions, you see. Some wars can be justified. Of course, there are always the wars in which we're involved. We're always on the right side. We will be, we will remain in, our in the present moral dilemma of being called upon constantly, you see, to support that for which in our deepest beings we know is wrong. And I was astonished and shocked to see former President Eisenhower say only yesterday that he thought it was terrible that Americans were publicly demonstrating against American policy in Vietnam. Here's an ex-president of the United States who can say that we ought not publicly to show our dissent. You know, the further back in history a war is, as we look at the historical process, the less justified it seems to be. The closer to us, we can always discover all sorts of justifications for a war, can't we? How many of you know the War of the Spanish Succession? Wasn't that a great moral crusade? And the victor, you know, was the Duke of Marlborough, the ancestor of Winston Churchill. How many of you can tell me what the issues were on which that war turned? And why it was morally desirable that the Duke of Marlborough win after creating so many corpses? Robert Southey, you remember in his famous poem, The Battle of Blenheim, imagines a little boy who comes across the field of battle at Blenheim and picks up skulls and bones and odd toes, you know, as you would on a field of battle. Tremendous numbers of bones. Have you ever looked at a field of battle? And he picks up one of the bones and goes to his father, his grandfather, and says, Grandfather, what do these mean? And the grandfather says, well, I don't know. This was the Battle of Blenheim, and it was a famous victory, you remember, for the Duke of Marlborough. And the little boy replies, well, but what was the victory about? See, what good did it do for mankind? And Salvi puts it in these words, with which I'd like to conclude. Not that I have the answer, necessarily, although I have my own position, which you're familiar with, but that you must think about this question, which to me is the overwhelming moral issue in the 20th century. And everybody praised the Duke, who this great fight did win, says Salvi. But what good came of it at last, quoth little Peter Kin. Why, that I cannot tell, said he, but 'twas a famous victory.'" 